Tiffany. Tiffany is a senior scientist at the Rockman Research Initiatives at Baycrest, and she's the Associate Professor of Neurology and Geriatric Psych uh, Psychiatry at uh, University of Toronto, and the author of The Memory Clinic, which offers new insights into Alzheimer's. So with that, Tiffany? Uh, the point is not to try to teach you something in the next 20 minutes. Rather, I would like to put out there some of the terminology that we use when we're talking with our patients and our families, and especially when I have been working with uh, younger people who either have been caregivers to patients with dementia or who are in high school and are really interested in neuroscience and the brain. Not just because they're thinking they want to be doctors in the future, it is actually because the brain is, for many people, still the final frontier. And it is exciting to them and we can capitalize on that. Especially when we consider what you'd like to accomplish. So let's go on. Um, the other thing that uh, I do want to talk about is the, uh, the fact that isolation, the feeling of being isolated, is actually a risk factor for dementia. Um, this all has to do, I believe, with the concept of cognitive reserve. How many people have actually heard of cognitive reserve? It is the thing, for the rest of you, that may be standing between you and manifesting symptoms of dementia once you get older. Many of us, if not all of us, will change the way that we uh, produce the proteins that we're currently producing in our brains. We're all sitting here manufacturing amyloid, we're all manufacturing tau. But at a certain age, that may differ from person to person based on genetics or environmental exposures, your ability to produce those proteins the way they're supposed to work is debilitated or your ability to fix them once they've come out the wrong way or clear them out of the way is lower than it was when you were 20 or 25 or 30 or 40. Just because you have abnormal protein collections in your brain doesn't mean that you will show uh, acquired progressive memory loss or difficulty multitasking or inability to drive a car. It is the disconnection that it can be caused by those abnormal proteins and their after effects that will cause your disability. If you have cognitive reserve, I put the vault door here because it's kind of like having money in the bank against which you can withdraw for a while even though you have these abnormal proteins. It allows you to compensate for various brain injuries and insults. I brought that up just now in the context of abnormal protein in the brain but if someone has, if two different people have a head injury of the same degree, but one of them has more cognitive reserve than the other, the person with cognitive reserve may have either a quicker recovery or a more full recovery or may not have had as severe a symptom set during the, the acute concussive period. So this is really kind of like uh, safeguarding or, or insulating your brain from things that are going to happen. Unless you're gonna wrap yourself up in bubble wrap and stay inside and be isolated, things are gonna to happen to you. Our skin changes, our brains change, our joints change, but we want to make sure that the function is maintained for as long as possible. Cognitive reserve is not just about how much content you have in there or what your fund of knowledge is. It's actually about your repertoire, your adaptability to different situations, your cognitive flexibility, your emotional flexibility, Unfortunately, people with recurrent depression or severe anxiety disorders are at risk for getting dementia down the line, partly because of that emotional rigidity. Um, when we deal with other people, new people in a room, old friends but who are changing or have their own issues, that is a challenge to the brain. That's not just exercising one little piece of the brain. That's making everything fire off, right? You have memories, you have a shared history with that person, but they're throwing a new challenge your way. You need to meet that challenge emotionally, intellectually, in a way where you're communicating with each other in a way that's effective, monitoring whether you are being effective. This is one of the ways in which being isolated actually keeps you from being able to maintain your cognitive reserve. Another way of putting cognitive reserve, um, if you've been on an airplane and you flip to the back of an airline magazine, you can see the different hubs that the airline offers. And this is an example of an airline that has only one hub. 
So if there's a hurricane that comes through Georgia, nobody who has a flight on this airline is going anywhere anytime soon. However, if you have some airline that has more hubs that are able to operate, you're in better shape. You may have to do a triangulation to get to the point where you wanted to, uh, that you were originally booked for, but you'll still get there. And that's sort of an oversimplified way of explaining how cognitive reserve would work. <laughs> if you have only one way of retrieving a piece of information in your head, and that way is blocked by a stroke, by head trauma, by dementia, your host, you're not going to get that piece of information. But if you have wonderful ways of cross-referencing cross information or cross-referencing, uh, doing lots of ways of approaching a problem, then you're covered. So to come back to cognitive reserve, we know that some degree of formal education, and it's really panning out to be more like seven or eight years of formal education as opposed to requiring a university level of education, can set you up with a nice basis of cognitive reserve. But diversity of experience can be just as important as how many years you sat in that schoolroom. In fact, my bias is that continuing diversity of experience throughout your life can be really important to expanding the repertoire. Again, it's not how many factoids you've tossed into your head that, deserve, that, that determines your cognitive reserve. It's how you've acquired that information. Um, one more example of cognitive reserve. I know um, not all of you read MRIs every day, but we're looking at a side view. This is the man's eyeball. This is the top of his head, the back of his head, his neck is down there off screen. Um, you're seeing the bottom of the brain called the cerebellum. And you can see that the gray thing here, his brain, is a little bit smaller than it used to be. It's pulled away from the inside of the skull, so it's kind of sitting down with, with, with uh, gravity. But um, right here, you can see that this part, the temporal lobe, used to fill in much more of that intracranial space. At the time that we did this MRI scan, despite the fact that this man has severe atrophy in his left temporal lobe, which handles language, some degree of memory, uh, and emotional um, processing, he's still able to send me emails about his own health care, organize his own flights to get from Washington to California, to see me. We may not be able to prevent this kind of atrophy from hitting a person's brain for a really long time, maybe even during our lifetimes. But if we can build up the cognitive reserve, then this is what we should be aiming for, you and I. Maybe the kids who are in high school now can aim for something else. But right now, the thing that's pertinent to us is cognitive reserve. Isolation is a relative term. How many of you need your alone time? Yeah, not isolated during that time because it has a different meaning to you. It is your creative time, it is your rest time, it is your recharge time, whatever it is for you, it has meaning. So one of the things that I hesitate about here with the isolated no more slogan is that some seniors need to spend most of their time alone. I'm probably gonna be one of those. Um, but we need to give them uh, uh, resources so that they can enhance the meaning of their lives. Why am I waking up in the morning? Why am I bothering to brush my teeth and get into my clothes and walk out the front door? With respect to building cognitive reserve, you had talked about um, through formal education and diversity of experience and that. Can you also still build the cognitive reserve when you are 70 or is it something that only happens when you're in your younger years? It's something you could be encouraging old Rattle to say, you can still do this now because we know with chronic disease and everything else, it's never too late to start to be active or to, to eat well, but is it too late in 70 to build cognitive reserve? So, wonderful question. I did not plant this question. <laughs> Many of the things that are good for your brain are still good for I your brain, that part down there. even after you've been diagnosed with dementia. Having some kind of social activity and not being isolated helps to you to prevent the depressive symptoms of any of our dementia syndromes. Uh, they can make your quality of life better despite the fact that you're carrying a label of whatever diagnosis it may be. So don't stop any of these things at any age. Interestingly, that bit about leisure reading was a wonderful paper that gives hope to those who, for whatever reason, stopped their education at sixth grade. The war came, we needed to work, whatever. Those people who did well cognitively, and I don't know if it's a causal relationship, I don't think the authors of the paper can make that point either. But having leisure reading as a regular hobby 
was correlated with the people who don't develop mild cognitive impairment or dementia. So you can compensate for that short formal educational career with leisure reading. It doesn't have to be nonfiction. It could be whatever it is. It could be newspapers. I mean, there are some newspapers out there that are quite erudite, and I can't even get through them all. But um, it's very interesting. The idea, again, comes back to your repertoire, your social repertoire, your intellectual repertoire, your activity, physical activity repertoire. You want to keep working on that the whole time, the whole time, over the entire lifespan. The other comment that you made that, that, that's really interesting to me and why I want to bring the idea of brain health into high schools is that if you tell kids not to smoke, that only gets you so far. If you tell them that it'll give them a heart attack, the mentality is, that's okay, I'll drop dead, I'll be, I'll, I'll uh, live hard, die young, right? That's not motivating. What is motivating is, I do want to have all my faculties together until the day I drop dead of whatever it is. We're all gonna die, but how do you want to go? How do you want it to look? How do you want that future to look? What's it like for you when you're spending time with somebody who does have <coughs> cognitive impairment? On the one hand, you can enjoy all those other things about them that they can still do and have a great time together, feel safe, feel connected. That's great. There's no loss there. But if you're sorry that they can't remember <coughs> what you did last week together each time you see them, well, that's our opportunity to tell them about brain health and to motivate them to do the same <coughs> things that do prevent heart attack and stroke but for a different reason. Singing is an interesting workaround to get words out of a person's mouth. A person may not be able to initiate language and sentences. They may be able to say a word at a time, but you put on their favorite golden oldie, and wham, they are Elvis Presley. You take them to the karaoke bar because they're gonna win the nighttime contest. And that is so joyful for everybody involved. The person who's known that, that, that patient for a long time can allow that person to express themselves fluently in song. The person who's singing has the satisfaction of, ah, okay, now I'm on. So there are all kinds of adaptations to the things we used to do, whether that's expressing ourselves, communicating with others, building a birdhouse, whatever, that we who want to help the people who are lo losing cognition or losing cognitive skills to do what they used to do or find new ways to do the same old thing. So absolutely, music, and you've been hearing about this a lot, the Alzheimer's Society has much more of a passive way of enjoying music, which is you put the headphones on and you let people remember by themselves, have a calm moment, but hearing their favorite music, or sometimes it evokes memory. As opposed to evoking language, it can evoke memory. It's wonderful. Uh, so yes, thank you for bringing that up. And the arts, I think, Peter, Peter are you gonna talk about the arts? during your 20 minute thing? Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's kind of sliding things over to Peter. He's very apt at all of these. Uh, but the arts are very much a part of where uh, many centers like Baycrest are going <coughs> in terms of providing programming to seniors with all their faculties, with some of their faculties, with all, hardly any of their faculties, to help have quality of life and to find those avenues, those remaining avenues of expression. On a day-to-day -day basis, introverted personalities and extroverted personalities are really quite different and it had crossed my mind even before we came in here to ask the question is there work being done to delineate between the two and the difference in care that perhaps should exist I think between those two types of yeah no I think this is where autonomy your right to decide what you're going to do that day which programs you're going to sign up for comes in because I may seem like an extrovert to you because I'm on but I really value my alone time. And if I don't get it when I want it, so but I don't think we need to, I don't, I don't think we need to interview each senior and figure out how introverted versus how extroverted they are. They can make choices. I'm actually sort of talking about it at a higher level because typically by the time we get to that, we may not be in a position to make choices effectively for ourselves anyway. So okay. the question is in terms really of research, you know, is, is there work being done about the difference in aging and what that means? Because I, you know, I've heard stats about how quickly people die when they move into care facilities, yeah. how short the times are. And I'm sort of wondering, are there some of us in this room that should never be in that kind of care facility and others that should be the same way we're sort so, of dividing ADHD kids from others now? The quick answer to this very important question is no, unless Peter knows of a study that is tracking this. 
we, we have other fish to fry, but this is a really important point that, again, I think we need to take to a community level. We need to make people aware that now is the time to be having conversations with the people who are your powers of attorney in terms of settings that you would like to see yourself in or not. And I don't think it's fair to say, I don't want to be in that nursing home, I want to be in that nursing home, because that version of yourself may still be a stranger to you. What's most important is four things. Safe, loved, happy, healthy. These are variations on the theme of love and kindness and meta. Where do you feel safest? How do you feel most beloved? When are you most happy? What makes you feel the most healthy? These are the things that the people who care about us most need us to indicate to them so that those are the criteria that they will use when we can't live at home, if we can't live at home, or how they need to set the home up for us if we can't mentally be flexible enough to accept option C as something that's still safe. Safe, loved, happy, healthy. This is actually a lifelong pursuit. Mm -hmm. You should be able to effect this every day. If you can only get three out of four, that's pretty good, but you're not gonna be able to sustain what you're doing unless you've got all four burning at the same time. But we need to really, uh, this is a corporate term which I usually try to steer away from, but blue sky. All the people that you know who might benefit from being drawn out of isolation, what are the different things that they would like to do? That they would actually do with some regularity? They don't have to do something every week, they could do something every month, they could do something every quarter. The idea here is to whittle away at isolation. And it happens in different ways for different reasons. Whether it's mobility, fear of falling, fear of doing something new. I never do something new. I stay out of trouble that way. Oy. Now, I've been to the, uh, the uh, YM, YMCA, the Y, <laughs> at, uh, near Young and Eglinton. And almost everything there is offered for free. Um, uh, in terms of places to gather, you can book a room and gather. So why do we have to tie a gathering in with food and you have to bring food? You can do a potluck of stories. Talking with other people is actually free. You can do it anywhere. You need to provide places where people can do so in an environment where they are welcome. And the building of repertoire is not dependent upon paying to hear a former professor or a current professor lecture. It's about expanding what you're doing, how you're interacting, reviving old memories based on what somebody else has said, and then being able to talk about that with somebody else who may have gotten something different out of the same story. The whole thing about narrative, and Peter has introduced me to narrative medicine, and, um, and that's a whole other talk, but there are many ways that we can get people together that will not cost them money. It may cost somebody else money. Like somebody's gotta pay for the, the lease on the building upon uh, in which the Y does its things. But that's where we can advocate with policymakers. There are institutions that are mandated to provide this kind of service. You know, their rent is paid by the Ministry of Health or other sort of programmatic resources that are, that are <coughs> municipal. And we need to be creative about how we can offer something that isn't going to cost them money or make them feel ashamed because they can't contribute something material. But we bring meaning if we allow them to hear or share stories. Um, what, what I've been listening to, um, and, and especially when you're talking about it, it's never too late. It's never too late to, to bring things in for, for creating the cognitive reserve. Um, my concern is we cut it off too early in schools because especially if we're talking about what you can what you can have happening in high schools is great but by that time most of the kids have already decided they're not an artist they're not they're not going to be a dancer they're not going to be a singer like all the things have been cut out because there's so much concern about um, standardized testing and, and in the early grades that gets priority over everything and and I'm thinking um, what better way to truly start engaging seniors? Like, my sense is, 
when we're thinking about programs that we can bring to people, the best thing is to get them being part of the process of creating the programs themselves, rather than just parachuting a program in. And so what about getting seniors together with the science that you've got about the importance for cognitive reserve and, and having it become a lifestyle choice that young children start to make, but include seniors in saying, let's get into the advocacy part of this as well. Like, why, why don't you find the seniors who, who want to be part of, of standing up and saying, what's happening in our schools is not serving our society. And, um, and, and, and being part of how are we all going to change that together? Like rather than designing a blueprint for what, what needs to happen, get the wisdom of the crowd um, creating the, the vision for where things can go and start advocating and getting, and we, I think we still have the right government in place in Ontario <laughs> to really um, make things happen. Um, in, in that direction if, if they start seeing that there's, there's a, a whole new rising um, um, center of, of desire coming from, from a community that really hasn't been saying much in that, in that regard, but have probably so much to say. I hope that on the videotape you've captured that entire train of sentences because there were at least two ideas in each sentence. <laughs> That's fabulous. Okay, and we need to take those apart and put them up on the on the pieces of paper because there were things ranging from advocacy to allowing kids to keep doing stuff even though they don't think they're great at it. Diversity. Diversity of what you're doing, the, your repertoire. You could have a drawing class for non-artists and that would debrief or debulk all of the stress over, oh, but I suck at art, and I've actually been told I'm a mathematician, and I need to become a scientist, and scientists don't do art. Well, ha, that's not true. You know, maybe we need to find scientists who are actually also renowned or not so renowned artists, but who don't do it because they love it. And, and so the intergenerational experience in that case can be, yeah, I make more money doing this, but actually I enjoy these other things as well. This is a balanced life. What is a balanced life? It's so hard for high school students, especially seniors, to get a sense of that because they've been focused so hard on getting into the next step and then after that getting into the next step of graduate school. That's a whole different, larger issue of, you know, do you need to be goal-directed? What are the goals? You know, if you want to become a doctor, yeah, you end up having to go to medical school. Or you say, I want to be a different kind of doctor. And you don't go to medical school, you do something else. What are the possibilities? We want to show everybody of all ages what the possibilities are so that uh, the people that Marilyn was talking about can decide you know I don't want to do a six-week program in which I am due at the junior high every week I just want to go fishing when I go fishing and if somebody else wants to jump along fine I mean one of the things that, that is the danger of me standing here behind a podium with a mic and you don't have the same setup is that it sounds like I'm supposed to solve this or give you answers but all the answers are here in the room and out there with the people you will talk to. We're not going to solve everything today, but we'll create a language with which you can approach others and get them on board to advocate for these resources popping up and being tried and maybe failing. I'm open to some of these ideas failing. And then other ones will succeed, maybe only a little bit, but you'll build on it and you'll iterate. And that's business design. And business design includes having all the stakeholders contribute to the design of the thing that has a purpose. It's not you're designing it just because it looks good on paper. You have goals for adding meaning to people's lives. That's a great goal.